voters on their election views. On Wednesday, the van pitched up in Port Rush. As, as an economist, uh, looking at this region of Northern Ireland, how does it differ to the UK? Because a lot of the issues we're talking about is exactly what the rest of the UK is talking about. Yes, indeed, and in many ways the region is quite similar. It's got pockets of absolute brilliance. The van's appearance on BBC Breakfast proved a rude awakening for some. What's this ridiculous butty van about? And can you tell me how much this is costing the BBC? Unless it is free or being heavily subsidised, this is a total waste of taxpayers' money. That budget perhaps not stretching far enough, though. Because of the unique way the BBC is funded, we've only actually got one microphone. It wasn't just the cost of the roving roll outlet that had you spluttering in your coffee either. I was astounded to be presented with the team clowning around with a butty van. You could not make it up. The BBC's job is to present the news in an unbiased way, not to attempt to make it. You are a disgrace to your forebears. The presentations themselves were childish and slapstick. John Craven's news round was even presented in a more serious way, and that was for kids. Slapstick. Adam Bullimore is the man in charge at BBC Breakfast. We put your views on the show's BAP mobile to him, and this is what he had to say in response. BBC Breakfast is out and about across the UK during the election campaign to hear what voters are saying and bring them together with politicians and experts. Our butty van and sofa are the visual focal point of our coverage and proving popular with the audience who come to see us on location. We will continue to report on the big, important election issues, but also have just a little bit of fun along the way. When it comes to the BBC's election coverage, it hasn't just been the style of the coverage you've been criticising, but also the content, with many feeling the corporation's reporting has been biased. I'm not usually one to complain, but BBC News have driven me to it with their very obvious political bias. They are now nothing more than a mouthpiece for the Tories. Can you please tell me why the BBC is so biased towards the Tory party? I thought the BBC, owned by the people, was supposed to be neutral in all things. In the interests of impartiality, however, it is only fair to point out that we also received the following. Why are all BBC programmes so unbelievably biased against the Conservatives and Brexit? I thought news programmes were supposed to provide information on all sides without forcing their views on us. I have watched today what can only be described as the BBC Labour News. It was so biased it sounded as if they had some input into the Labour manifesto. I journeyed into the heart of the BBC's news operation to put those accusations of bias to the person responsible for the BBC's flagship news bulletins. Some of our, our viewers think that the news is biased one way or the other. What do you have to say to that? Well, I mean, unsurprisingly, I'd reject the idea that the news is bias and to sort of reassure audiences, we go through meetings, processes, discussions, editorial discussions all day as we prepare the news and prepare it for broadcast. And so news in itself can be controversial. There can be a range of opinions, particularly during election periods when you've got different political parties saying different things. But I want to reassure audiences of BBC News that we go through a lot of stages every day, very carefully. We take a lot of care to ensure that the news isn't biased. Coming to A. Coming to a. In other interviews, all sorts of nice programs. One interesting thing is when you don't cover a story, Paul, so a march happens and someone's on it and they say, well, where is it in the news? Well, the bulletins that I look after, there's a, there's a finite space and there's a lot of competition for that space. Quite often in those particular cases, somewhere within BBC News, the website or uh, radio or, or, or another platform, that story is being covered. We may have covered an issue three months ago, it comes up again now. The judgment on the day is actually we have discussed and covered and analysed that issue fairly recently, so it's not going to get on today because we think we've got something else which is more important, more significant, or the audience um, would perhaps prefer to be hearing about. Is being unbiased just a destination you never quite reach? Absolutely, because I think we are committed to impartiality, we are committed to delivering for audiences, and it's not our job to demonstrate or show bias, and I think the experience and the quality of the reporters and the producers and the programme editors we have, we are pretty successful at delivering that.
Whether it's to compliment or criticise something you see on the BBC over the next seven days, please do get in touch with your point of view. You can drop us a line at pov at bbc.co.uk or contact us via our website where you will also find links to catch up on the programmes we discussed this week. The address is bbc.co.uk slash pov. If you are social media savvy, you can tweet us at bbcpov. Or why not join in the conversation about the week's TV on our Facebook page? Just search for BBC Points of View. And if you prefer non-electronic forms of communication, you can, of course, put your pen to paper. Our postal address is Points of View, BBC Northern Ireland, Belfast, BT2, 8HQ. We're waiting to hear from you. This week saw the halfway point reached in BBC Two's dark new thriller. Unfolding over three episodes, Paula sees the life of a comprehensive school chemistry teacher take a torrid turn after a one-night stand with an odd job man originally called to rid her basement of rodents. I was thinking I might, uh, I get a pizza if you want to. Yeah, look, James, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but this is a really, really bad time for me. I'm sorry. Some of you were gripped from the outset. Got me hooked. Great drama. The acting was superb and the storyline is compelling. Can't wait for next week. But others felt the drama's opening episode was more likely to induce sleep than keep anyone awake at night. I lost interest halfway through. I thought it was all a bit dull and confused. Didn't get a feel for any of the characters. Not sure I'll be tuning in to any further episodes. You can make up your own mind on Paula by catching up via the iPlayer. The first two episodes are available now. Last weekend, BBC Two whisked us off for a whistle-stop tour around the haunts of one of Britain's best-loved authors. Historian Lucy Worsley was our guide in Jane Austen Behind Closed Doors, which aimed to show how the houses the author lived and stayed in influenced her writing. Now this might not be the big and glamorous ballroom that you were expecting, but it was possible to hold a ball in just an ordinary house. A novel delight by most accounts. Enjoyed watching it and learnt loads, even though I'm a massive Jane Austen fan. Fascinating to see and hear the insights into where and how Jane Austen lived. Thanks, BBC. But there were also complaints from those who felt the programme lacked both style and substance. What a total letdown. It was badly conceived, lacked a real insight, and put together with such an uninspired script and production. To have Lucy Worsley in almost every frame with her overstated mannerisms made one in the end switch off. From the 19th century life of a classics author to the rather different experiences of 1980s Essex Wheeler dealers. Taking us back to an era we'd probably all rather forget fashion-wise, BBC Two's new comedy, White Gold, follows the characters at a double-glazing sales room with a fast-talking and ever-so-slightly smarmy Vincent Swan at the helm. So what is it you sell? Double-glazing. Fancy. I quite like them patio doors. I bet they're expensive, though. Oh, you'd be surprised, Gillian. It appears the BBC may have struck gold with this one. Been enjoying White Gold enormously. May get a spiral perm and some acid wash jeans to celebrate. That's dedication for you. And there was approval from industry insiders too. I work in double glazing. Hilarious. Short but sweet, Mel. White gold may have dazzled some, but others found it to be no laughing matter thanks to the character's rather colourful language. I am incensed with this so-called comedy. Essex has gone to the dogs if all the county speaks such filth. My eyes are bleeding. God-awful, foul-mouthed tripe. Perhaps not for everyone, then. Finally this week, you've been paying tribute to one of Blue Peter's best-loved former presenters, John Noakes, who sadly passed away earlier this week. Sad, sad news. I grew up watching his exploits on Blue Peter and still feel dizzy just thinking about him climbing to the top of Nelson's column. He was exciting, funny and always must-see viewing for a teenager dreaming of adventure. Get down, Shep, was the unforgettable catchphrase. 
We're back on BBC One at quarter to five next Sunday. And until then, we will leave you with a clip of that, frankly, terrifying ascent. Take care. I found myself literally hanging from the ladder with nothing at all beneath me. <sighs> you told me there was overhang, but you didn't tell me it lent to one side. No, Did you? that was the awkward part. Oh, God. It's a what long you... way up, really, isn't it? Time now to get the news, travel and weather where you are. Hello there, good morning from BBC Spotlight. A woman whose mother died from mesothelioma in Devon, which is thought she contracted whilst working as a teacher, is calling for a change in the law over access to information on asbestos in school buildings. Lucy Stevens submitted more than 150 freedom of information requests about the issue to the UK's local authorities. One in ten failed to respond. Cornwall said it didn't hold the information centrally. In Devon, 221 schools were reported as having asbestos and in Dorset the figure was 65. It can take 40 to 50 years for the illness to develop. That's what happened with mum. And we need, we can't do anything about all of the exposures that have already happened, but we can do something about stopping more people being affected. And I don't want anyone to have to suffer like mum did. Farmers in Cornwall are calling for the return of a visa scheme to ensure they can employ seasonal workers post-Brexit. Thousands are needed every year to help with things such as fruit and veg picking. Many currently come from the EU and MPs and supermarkets are also lobbying ministers to give some certainty on the issue. At peak times, this farmer says he needs up to 60 workers from the Eastern Europe. If we're not able to source um, foreign labour, um, categorically, we will not be able to carry on doing things. We won't get enough labour. New aerial footage of Westwood Ho shot using a drone has been released, giving a bird's eye view of the resort's landmarks. The footage shows the beach and promenade, along with the refurbished tidal rock pool. Also clearly seen is the outline of the wreck of the merchant ship Sally, which ran aground in 1769 while sailing from Portugal to Bristol carrying a cargo of port. The footage was commissioned by Torridge District Council to highlight recent improvement work in the area.
Let's get the weekend weather forecast now from Lucy. Good morning. It's a bit of a mixed bag temperature-wise this morning. Where we've got the cloud, we're going to see a bit of milder start. But where there are clear skies, a really chilly start to the day and the chance of seeing some frost and fog patches first thing. We are turning cloudier as we move through the day. Some cloud coming in from the northwest. So let's put that detail on the map then. First thing, best of the brightness across Devon. Uh, that's where you could see the frost and fog. It'd be largely dry, that cloud pushing in from the northwest. Temperatures reaching a maximum of 11 degrees Celsius today. For the Channel Islands then, it's a cloudier story, largely dry through much of the day, although into the afternoon and evening just the chance of seeing a bit of drizzle, temperatures at a maximum of 9 degrees Celsius. Now these are your times of high water for today. At Plymouth it's at 9 minutes past 7 this morning and then at 26 minutes past 7 this evening. I'll leave you with the outlook. It's quite settled through the weekend, we will see a little bit of drizzle through Saturday but increasingly more in the way of sunshine but that breeze picking up through the weekend as well. Travel on the Torridge Bridge heading towards Biddeford. There are temporary traffic lights there for roadworks. Expect delays. And between Honiton and Offwell on the A35, lights there as well for roadworks. Expect delays. That's it from us for the moment. I'll be back with an update at around 5 to 8. Hello, welcome back. You're watching Breakfast with Charlie State and Naga Manchetti. It's your time now, 6.28. All latest news and sport coming up in just a moment. Also on Breakfast this morning. So please make sure I have it. OK. <laughs> As Faulty Towers' bungling waiter Manuel, he created one of Britain's best-loved comedy characters. The actor Andrew Sachs has died at the age of 86. We'll talk to his son. We're fine. I was playing great uh, leading up to this tournament. He was unbelievable on the clay. He was playing great at Wimbledon. So I think you get a better idea of how tough the customer this guy is on this surface at 34. Certainly like a fine wine better than ever. His serve is awesome. But I was amazed of all the things I was amazed at because I've seen him play a bunch of times. He's got the sweet hands. He stays back more now. But the biggest surprise is how fit he looked late in that match still at 13 all taking it to Rafael Nadal who's the fittest toughest most energized person who's I don't think anyone's ever tried harder on a tennis court and still this guy Muller after dropping four other match points yeah. I mean most mortals are going to say against Nadal who wants it so bad it's frightening okay I give in too good but this <laughs> guy hung with it unbelievable effort and that is the, the thing Tracy incredible fitness mentally and physically but also patience an hour and a half later he gets another chance at a match point. <laughs> and to be able to sustain that, again, against Rafa, who just keeps coming at you and keeps coming at you, this is really a phenomenal story for Jules Muller. As John said, 34 years old and had never won a tour title until this year. I think he was 0-5 in finals and then finally won in Sydney and won another grass court event as well. This really shows that you can be so fit in your mid-30s and now this one, the biggest match in his career. Why didn't we think of that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're like 25, we're over the hill. <laughs> you know, this guy's tired. 34 and he's way better than he's ever been. It his, is his ground strokes were amazing because I don't remember his backhand being this solid and this good. He was always kind of a slasher with the forehand, but he was solid from the backcourt. Well, it really has been the most fantastic day of tennis and it has only just finished. Um, there's a little thing buzzing right in front of that camera. Can you see that? Should I go to this one instead? We'll try and get That's rid of that. Anyway, we're going to, exactly, we're going to try and wrap up as many of the matches as we possibly can between now and 9.30. And we're going to start with the British number one on the women's side trying to reach her first quarterfinal here at Wimbledon. On court, Joanna Conta rarely lets the mask slip. We hardly get to peer beyond the professional veneer. What a battle! What resilience! But there is another Joanna. To take a break, she bakes cakes. She's been handing out muffins to her coaching team. The best on tour, she claims. Maybe it's useful preparation because Wimbledon 
is all about rising at the right time. And an American has got that. And when it comes to the big occasions, Conta has been proving that she is nerveless. She stays calm, she stays very much in the moment, and she broke in the opening game, racing to a 3-1 lead. And Conta actually served for the first set at 5-4, but Garcia then woke up, came smashing back, and soon they were into a first set tiebreak. Nick Mullins and Tracy pick up the story with Conta leading 3-1 in that tiebreak. Anticipation from Conta, but then she had to execute. Go on, Miss Conta. Shot that establishes now a couple of mini breaks in this first set tie break. Below our noses in the commentary box, Tracy. It felt out. It was close, but it felt out. 4 2. So at this stage, I think it's all about handling the nerves. It's going to remind yourself to have good footwork, maybe a little extra spin on your shots, but continue to have that same racket head speed. Interesting hearing Conta quoting Billie Jean King over the last couple of days, saying, pressure is a privilege. Pressure is a privilege. And this is the privilege that she's earned right now. Still with a mini break in this first set tie break, 4-2. Conta was ready for the forehand. She's halfway there. Joe Conter halfway there to a Wimbledon quarterfinal. She's won the first set on the tiebreak, 7 6. A roar from Contra. She took that tiebreak, but at the start of the second set, it was all Caroline Garcia. The Frenchwoman broke Contra's serve twice to race into a 5 1 lead, but Contra stuck at her and won three games in a row to close the gap. <laughs> Conta refusing to allow the second set to end here. Conta then held serve to make it 4-5, but Garcia still had the advantage, and this is her serving for the second set. Fifteen. 
extra nervous at this moment. You keep it simple. Go to simple patterns, more cross court, good footwork. Continued to ta target the Conta forehand. No nerves so far. No. She has been good and strong. Much to the delight of her father. Hour and 37 minutes. Three points to take us into a third set. to get the job done and we're level with a set of piece so into the decider and there have been no breaks of serve no break points or even juices both women have been holding serve easily we're rejoining with Garcia serving at four five down so needing to hold again to stay in the match Feel it. Loudest they've Love been. 50. Solid. How impressive. 15. Great technique and depth on this backhand volley. to read the serve just a little swing towards the left there and it went to the right doing in 1984 may not even have been born it's the last time a British woman reached the quarterfinals of 30, Wimbledon 40. Since another Joe, since Joe Jury, all those years ago. There are always momentum shifts, and I definitely felt I, I shifted the momentum slightly in my favour, although I lost that second set in the end. Um, but uh, 
I think it definitely uh, it, it made us start the third set off uh, in more uh, an even keel and uh, I, um, I still felt very clear on what I was trying to achieve out there and uh, I, um, I was definitely not disheartened by going into a third and, uh, and really looked forward to, uh, to, to having another battle. People talk about the crowd and the impact and the adrenaline it creates. Did you feel it make a difference out there today? Obviously, a home crowd is, is that much more emotionally invested and that much more, uh, I guess, living and dying with your, with your points. And the support I felt out there was, quite frankly, just phenomenal. It was so nice talking to Jo after that win. I mean, a terrific result, a great run for her here at Wimbledon. I think, Tracy, she was sort of shocked, actually, when it was over that quickly, that last game. I think she was fully expecting Garcia to hold and it go on and on like Rafa did. They had both been holding pretty easily. Garcia served so well the entire match and she became much more aggressive in the second set. That's how she was able to turn the match around. But to me, Garcia has a lot of weapons, but in the past, it's always been a little brittle when it gets to the crucial situations. And we saw that in the last game. She really just didn't get enough balls back in play. And boy, did jo, Johanna, Johanna, Joe or Johanna? Yes, yes. Oh. She, uh, <laughs> it's she, confusing. It's yes, confusing, but correct. she fought so well in another battle. I mean, before coming in to this year's Wimbledon, she'd only won one match at Wimbledon and lost five times. I mean, that just shows how much improvement she's made. And I think most of it's between the ears. Some so lot, mentally it, strong. It does also show, because my understanding, and I'm not real close to this, the sports psychology aspect of it, because clearly she's been talking to a group of people for a fairly significant amount of time now. And that seems to have made a real impact on her ability to battle harder and dig deeper, which is a quality you need to go deep in an event Especially like this. Especially here because yeah. I mean, for the first time, there's really all this focus on her, and she just seems to be unruffled by it and just focusing on her she's matches. She's ready, and that's the thing. You know, she's not an 18, 19-year-old. But this is very difficult because even Garcia, she knows what it's like to have the pressure of a home Grand Slam at the French Open where she got to the quarters this year. But she shares that. She shares that with Cornet and Mladenovic. For Conta, yes, Heather Watson played so well earlier, but. For the most part, it's all about Conta on the woman's side. She's the one in the top 10. And it's all so new to her, and she seems to be handling it with ease. Yeah, I, I actually think she's enjoying it. Well, I would believe that because it's complete unknown, Ostapenko won the French, that that allowed other people like us to sit here and discuss and talk about how many women could win the tournament. So in effect, it actually took some pressure off her, I believe, because you're like, anyone could win this. All 16 <laughs> of these players could do it. Well, she's one of them, but she's only one of those people. So I w despite the fact that you look at the odds, the bookmakers have her, at least as of I think this morning, that she was the favorite yeah. to win it. So considering she'd only won one round, one match at Wimbledon, that's rather amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. And just to repeat the fact that she's the first British woman into the quarterfinals since 1984, and that is long before Jo herself was even born, because she wasn't born until 1991. Now, from the women's number one in Great Britain to the men's number one, Andy Murray was up against a Frenchman called Benoit Père, he of the luxurious facial hair. And Benoit 